Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome everyone to Sports Spectrum. I'm Jason Romano. Thanks for joining us on the show today. As we always do here at Sports Spectrum, we want to just thank you for listening to this podcast, for downloading this podcast, wherever you're listening, whether it's Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, Stitcher, even Apple iTunes podcasts. We just love that you tune in, that you check us out here at Sports Spectrum. Do us a favor, click that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast. Today's guest, a really great story with Kent Bottenfield. He is a former Major League Baseball pitcher and currently the head baseball coach at Palm Beach Atlantic University in Florida. Kent was selected by the Expos in the fourth round of the 1986 MLB draft, just 17 years old when he was selected by the Expos, made his Major League Baseball debut six years later with the Expos against the Dodgers, July 6th, 1992. He pitched for 10 seasons in the majors with the Expos, Rockies, Giants, Cubs, Cardinals, Angels, Phillies, and Astros. In 1999, with the St. Louis Cardinals, he had his best season. He went 18-7 and and was named to the Major League Baseball All-Star Game as a representative of the National League and actually pitched in that All-Star Game, a very memorable All-Star Game, and we'll talk about that on the podcast. And Kent was named the head baseball coach at Palm Beach Atlantic University in 2012, replacing a legend the Baseball Hall of Fame catcher Gary Carter, the former Met and Montreal Expo. Lots of good stories here to talk about with Gary Carter as well. A true legend and a guy that Kent played with and then certainly Kent replacing him uh, at Palm Beach Atlantic as the baseball coach. I love this interview. Kent's a really good guy. He has some great stories and I know you'll love it too. Take a listen to Kent Bottenfield here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Kent, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. It's great to be here. It's it's good to have you here, Kent. Ten years in the majors uh, and just doing my research, and, and I was telling you before we started taping that in talking to uh, many people in the different circles that I've walked, a few of them have suggested, because we've had this podcast now for a few years, that we should be having Kent Bottenfield on. So I'm glad that we're able to have you on the show. We like to start from the beginning in a lot of these interviews, and it started like I said, 10 years in the majors, but when you were selected as a 17-year-old kid by the Montreal Expos in 1986, you go from Portland, Oregon, where you grew up, to my to Montreal. What memories come back to you uh, when you think about going back to the beginning uh, of that chapter? Well, it was, uh, it was a thrill. I, I really had no idea that Montreal was going to draft me. I had been contacted by several scouts that spring uh, while finishing my high school years. Um, I was excited. I mean, Montreal was really was an up-and-coming team, even though it was Canada. I was familiar with them and some of their players and uh, thought it was a, a great setup to get drafted in the fourth round was, was really exciting for me as well. I was actually headed to Oklahoma State, uh, and the day that I was supposed to go there with my letter of intent to sign is the day I left for Jamestown, New York, to start my minor league career. And so uh, it opened up a a whole new world for me, uh, but it was a thrilling event to be drafted. I get excited to see these kids here. They get drafted because I know what they're feeling. Um, But, yeah, and to be drafted by Montreal, I I like to say you know you're getting old when the teams you played for don't exist anymore. So. (laughs) That, but I had, a, I had a good experience with them uh, from the very start. That is true. You know, that, the Expos. And I, I grew up, I still think the Expos uniforms are classic. I think the, 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 the Nationals wore them a couple months ago, I think, for one of their games in Washington, D.C. And uh, they still have such classic uniforms. I love those. And then it wasn't until a few years later, it was 1992, July 6th, actually, that you made your Major League Baseball debut. What do you remember about that day? Uh, you know, what I remember first is leading up to that day, I was actually uh, about ready to lead the game. Uh, I had struggled uh, early on that year in, in AAA, 
and I uh, was going out to uh, – I just had a struggle at home against the Royals AAA team and was pulled after a couple innings. And um, I only decided to go to Denver with the team because at the time it was AAA hmm. um, because I had a friend that was coming to visit me. And so I'm like, okay, I'll go on this last road trip. I'll pitch. You know, we'll have fun. And so I get out there, and I'm winning 2 nothing, and, and uh, it's going pretty good. And all of a sudden, I gave up a three-run home run to Kenny Williams, and I quit in my mind. First time ever on a baseball field, football, basketball court, uh, I quit. I didn't care anymore because mm. I'm like, I'm leaving anyway, so who cares? Wow. And uh, that actually turned my life around in a lot of ways because I went on. I think I struck out 12, didn't give up any more runs. We won the game. And it taught me a lesson I teach my guys now is that, that being on the mound has to mean everything to you and nothing to you all at the same time. And so it has to mean everything in your preparation for what you do. And it's a good life lesson, too. But once you get into the action, you have to just move along no matter what happens. You have to not care. Not that you don't try. You certainly try. But when you face obstacles within the course of a game, you have to just blow it off and keep moving on. And that gave me the freedom to go to the next game, which was in Oklahoma City, and pitched really well there. And um, I didn't know at the time, but the general manager was there watching. And I got the message from a hotel courtyard. Old <laughs> F.P. Santangelo yelled across the courtyard, hey, congratulations, Bob. And I'm like, what, what are you talking about? So you're going to the big leagues. I go, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, it's right here in USA Today. <laughs> and so that's how I found out I was getting called up. Um, and it was, I knew it was a spot start. Uh, it had to do with the games that were canceled earlier in the year because of the Rodney King issues in L.A. Mm -hmm. um, Montreal was in San Diego, and were they were scheduled to go to L.A. for three games. It all got canceled, made up as part of three doubleheaders um, in July. And... I tell you, it was a dream come true. Uh, it was just an amazing time, and, and I ended up throwing four and a third. I missed the win by two-thirds of an out. Jeff Lucero came in and got a ground ball double playing out the win. But um, <laughs> when Felipe Lou came to take me out, and he said, don't worry, kid, you'll be back here soon. And uh, I was back within a couple months. So uh, an incredible day. Where is your faith during this time? And if it's not there, tell us where that took shape for you, started to take root for you. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those stories. I grew up in a, I grew up in a Christian home and, you know, we were in church every time the doors were open and, you know, I had parents that modeled, uh, their faith, uh, consistently, which was a big help. I didn't come to Christ until I was 17 and I was actually down here in my first year of instructional league. And I was at a, a church. We had Sundays off during instructional league and I was going to the college group, um, it was in a church service, and I didn't go forward that day, but when I got back to my apartment, um, I just realized that baseball couldn't be everything. Um, I loved it and was having some early success at it, but it couldn't be everything. And and I was obviously I knew what salvation was just growing up in the home that I did, but it was at that time that I made that commitment. So when I got to L.A., um, you know, I had a relationship, personal relationship with Christ. It shaped everything that I did, every decision that I made. Uh, I tried to be true uh, to that, tried to be true to Scripture when I was uh, playing the game, still to this day. Um, but it was important, and it was tough. And, you know, if people ever say Christian, Christianity is for wimps, uh, they don't understand what it's all about. I mean, Christianity, to live it out and to attempt to be consistent and faithful is a lot of times can be very difficult, especially in the world of professional sports. Mm. Take us through uh, that 92 rookie year and kind of spiritually where you were, maybe some mentors, anybody that was able to, I know you, you played with Gary Carter uh, and I want to talk about Gary uh, a little more in a minute, but just kind of cro crossing paths with him, with him, your rookie year. What a, what a great guy to cross paths with, obviously. And I'm sure he changed the, your life in many ways, but where were, where were you with your faith that rookie year? Was that hard to you know, sort of incorporate that, I guess, into arriving into a major league baseball clubhouse. So I'm glad that you mentioned that and mentioned Gary specifically, because he is actually part of that story. My answer is, is has to do with him. Yeah. And when I got called back up, uh, the team was in Cincinnati. And so, um, got there the first night for the, for the game and I, I didn't pitch, but, 
um, he came up to me, and I'd, I'd known Gary from spring trainings. My wife actually years ago babysat for their kids, uh, so, you know, so I had a bit of a relationship with him. Mm. He's like, "Hey, man, I want you to come and meet uh, me and Tom, uh, me and Foley for for breakfast." I'm like, okay, sure. So he told me where to go. I show up. I walk up to the table. They're already there, and they got their Bibles open. <laughs> and that was that was my introduction to discipleship uh, in Major League Baseball. Uh, Gary was was a good friend, um, and that was just kind of the beginning of it, playing together. I only got to play with him for that month or so uh, because that was his last year. I actually was the starting pitcher for his last ever game, and that was pretty cool. Mm. Um, but, yeah, he you know he showed me right off the bat. It wasn't about, hey, kid, we're going to teach you about Major League Baseball. Hey, man, we're going to sit here and we're going to have a little bit of a Bible study. We're going to talk about faith. And so that was a huge impact on me. Was that a little intimidating for you to walk in and see two guys with Bibles and you're thinking, oh, no, I thought we were just going to have a meal here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I was at a place in my, you know, in my faith where I was very secure in it. Um, always have been since since day one. Yeah. Uh, not that I've been perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but you know, understanding what it meant to have a relationship with Christ, and I never was one to worry about what other people thought. Um, and so, no, it didn't. It I didn't know it was going to happen, but it certainly didn't surprise me, just because, like I said, I'd known Gary for a few years anyway, and we'd done Bible studies as team as a team in spring training and those kinds of things. So. Uh, didn't surprise me and, and really enjoyed it. Kent Bottenfield is our guest here on Sports Spectrum, the former Major League Baseball pitcher, now baseball coach with the Palm Beach Atlantic University baseball team. Kent, I want to ask you about the 90s. You played in an era, in an interesting era, certainly in a lot of places as well. You were in Montreal, Colorado, San Francisco, Chicago, and St. Louis. And I, I, I do want to focus on St. Louis for a minute because in many ways that 1998 season brought back the – the popularity of baseball after the 94 strike, but it was also the steroid era. And that's what we look back at it now and remember it as, as well, uh, besides all the guys hitting home runs for you as a pitcher during that time, what memories come back when you think about it now, maybe when people just ask you about what was it like to pitch in the nineties in that time frame with, you know, a, a strike and the return of baseball and the home run ball. And then certainly looking back to steroid era, what was that like for you to pitch during that era? Definitely um, an era that stands out in the history of the game. Um, yeah. So not always good things, as you've just mentioned, but there were some good things that were taking place. Sure. Uh, there were a lot of changes being made in the game at the major league level, just to strategically how the game was played um, the type of players they were looking for for different positions. I mean, there were a lot of changes happening. Um, and uh, unfortunately, one of those uh, was the introduction of the steroids. Mm. And, you know, it's just one of those things that you didn't think a lot about in the middle of it. There was there was always rumors about guys, you know, you whoever you were playing, it doesn't matter. Hey, you know, that guy is, is juicing and this, that, and the other. And yeah. But it's not like it was in the clubhouse. It's not like I walked in and saw one of my teammates, you know, taking a shot or whatever. And, and so – it was always one of those things where it was rumored, but you didn't know for sure. Um, if you looked at certain guys from one year to the next year, you could probably make an educated guess that something happened during the off season. Um, but it, you know, you didn't dwell on it. It wasn't like, oh man, you know, I had a bad day because two of those guys hit home runs off and they're juicing up. You know, it wasn't anything like that. Right. Um, but it was. It was frustrating. It was because definitely there was an advantage. Uh, offensively with the guys that did do it, um, but didn't focus on it. And like I said, it wasn't like you saw it every day and you were thinking about it every day. It was just part of the game. When you look back on it, you wonder at times how things may have been, could things have been better for, for guys like myself who didn't have, you know, dominating stuff that it didn't matter if the guy was juicing or not, you know, yeah. for us guys who were just pitchers and had average stuff and had to get by on pitches and, you know, our mistakes were easier to hit than the guys that were throwing 96. You know, you wonder, hey, could a game have changed here or there? Sure. But, you know, I don't spend a lot of my life living in the past. Uh, there's a, it was an interesting era. There's a weird tension from me as a fan. I'm 45, so I was in my 20s in the 90s and watching what was taking place happen. And I was captivated. Like the 98 year, you were in St. Louis when McGuire and Sosa were having the, the home run battle. Uh, and McGuire ends right. up hitting 70. Like I was captivated, as was every 
seemingly every fan, and I'm sure every player in a lot of ways, too. So there's hey, a weird... Man, I was captivated, too. Right. I mean, you were living in it. So there's a weird tension there for me, because I look back with with great memories watching that as a fan, yet I know that a lot of people don't even want to acknowledge that because of the aforementioned steroid era. But there's got to be good memories in experiencing something like that, I have to imagine, from your end as well, right? Uh, it was a incredible, it was an incredible time, uh, especially the home run race that you, you mentioned, um, just being a part of that, having a front row seat to that every day. And I'm going to tell you right now, the, the steroid issue never came up in my mind during that time. Right. Um, yeah. And I honestly, at the time, I didn't feel like McGuire was a part of it. Um, I just felt like he had incredible bat speed and incredible hand-eye coordination. Um, and so I never thought about that kind of stuff. It was just sitting there watching him. You, you know, you expected him to hit a home run every time he came up to bat, which is totally unfair right. to him. And I'm sure not, I'm not the only one that expected it, but if I'm, I'm sitting there every single day watching this, it's like if he didn't hit a home run, I was surprised. That's how crazy it got. Uh-huh. Um, but fun to be a part of it. The the energy in the stadiums that we were in, especially in St. Louis, obviously, yeah. uh, just great to be a part of. It's something I'll never forget. I have a um, in my home. I have a big panoramic picture of him uh, breaking the home run record uh, in St. Louis. Pretty pretty incredible. And so I, I do cherish that. I really do. Well, in your St. Louis years, uh, although they were just two of them, you know that saw you make your first all star, first and only all star game in 1999. And when you think about the era that we just described and sort of the offensive uh, juggernauts that were out there and you go 18 and seven with St. Louis and you pitch in that memorable 99 all-star game 20 years ago. I'll never forget it in Fenway park. Uh, Ted Williams is, is kind of taken out on a cart and all the players go and visit him and kind of pay homage to him. What was that game like to pitch in the 1999 all-star game surrounded by star after star hall of famer after hall of famer? Well, you know, I remember that pretty much every day because I have uh, a big, once again, panoramic picture of that scene uh, autographed by Ted Williams hanging here in my office, and it's him coming out on the golf cart, and everybody's lined up, and it's a, it just, I see it every single day, and it's That's a cool. reminder of, of how fortunate I, I feel to have been a part of that. But yeah, I mean, they were the the greatest players from the last 50 years were were standing around that field. And I certainly wasn't one of those guys, but to be there on that field at the same time and witness that, and none of us had any idea that, that they were going to bring Ted Williams out. We, we had no idea. Hmm. And so when that happened, if you, if you can imagine the electricity uh, at Fenway, and just to be a part of it, and when he comes around, he pulls up in the golf cart, and it's just amazing. I personally, I'm biased, of course. I think it was you know maybe one of the best all-star game, not just the game, but just the whole event probably ever last one of the century i mean just a lot of amazing things and so yep i look at it every day and i I count count my blessings for that what's the one memory that stands out for you from that game maybe aside from ted williams i was unbelievably tired (laughs) is that right (laughs) thrown i think six innings and you couldn't do this nowadays but i think after six and six or seven innings in san francisco on sunday and then uh, our owner had a plane for myself and McGuire took us. We stopped in St. Louis, picked up my family, and then went on to Boston. And just the amount of activity that takes place during those few days is incredible. And mm-hmm. so you're you're going from one place to the next. And these interviews and this event, uh, by the time I got on the mound, I was I was beat, you know. But didn't take away from my enjoyment of it. Uh, it just I told Tony Russo when I got back that what a great experience that was. But the All-Star Game is pretty much an individual accomplishment, even though my team did a lot of great things behind me to help me get those wins and, and all that. They certainly did. Uh, but I told him, man, I'd love to be in the same kind of environment but in a playoff in a World Series with my team. I never got a chance to do that, but it's that same kind of electricity for sure. Probably the other most memorable moment was I got booed at the All-Star Game because I – I hit Cal Ripken with a fastball, not on purpose, <laughs> um, but I got booed for that, and I probably should have. Kent, I want to ask you about after that 99 season, you're 30 years old, and just as quickly as you're 
you're you're at your highest point two years later, just two years later, your career is over. So I want to ask you about transitioning out of baseball. For some, it's a very difficult thing to leave professional sports, especially being so young, 30, 31, 32. What was that like for you? How was that transition away from baseball for you? Um, not as tough as it is for some, but not as easy as it is for some. You know, just the circumstances of which I left made it a little difficult. You know, I had that 99 season and I had 18 wins and um, they called me in the office in Cincinnati and they basically shut me down because I was having some shoulder issues, which, you know, was basically tendonitis. But they told me that, you know, if you continue to pitch your last two or three starts, this could leak over into the spring. And I decided to make the decision um to go ahead and be shut down. Uh, I didn't know if I'd ever, I, I mean, I felt like I'd have a chance at 20 wins again, just because of the team I was on and how they played behind me. Um, obviously I never got that chance again, but you know, it carried over into Anaheim. And when I, when I was traded for Edmonds and got over there and I started having some shoulder issues I'd never had. And then it carried into Philadelphia and to Houston over those next two short years. And it, it ended up being a surgery that, that ended my career. But transitionally, I've always said that baseball is not who I was. It's what I did, but it wasn't who I was. And so that wasn't my full identity. That certainly helped me make the adjustment um, out of the baseball world. But there are still, you know, still tough changes. I mean, you're you're spending so many years competing against the best players in the world at the highest level, and I'm a very competitive person. And now all of a sudden, what do you find out? You know, how do you scratch that itch at that point? Um mm-hmm. I wasn't as good at anything else as I was at baseball. And so that was a little bit of struggle, missing the, the competitive side of things, missing the people, you know, certain people that I've had in my life for a number of years, even with all the moving around, uh, that kind of thing. The being on the mound of the attention part of it, didn't care about that. Um, you know, I loved pitching. I loved being out there competing. But as far as anything that came along with it, attention-wise, I didn't miss that, never have. You but went, uh, so over Overall, an easy, easier adjustment than a lot of people, but always just some difficult aspects to it. What about the music side of this? Because you, you transition into, uh, at least immediately after retirement, a few years later, you release two albums, two contemporary Christian albums. So where is the music musical side of Kent Bottenfield during you know, during all this? And maybe were you musically playing and kind of thinking about music while you were still pitching in the majors? Uh, great question. I was to a certain point. You know, I grew up, I, I taught myself how to play the piano, and I would kind of use it even though I wasn't a Christian at that time. I still, you know, I was in church all the time, and I would use it as like kind of a quiet time. I'd write simple songs and sit at piano and sing and play them. Um, as I got into, as I got older, it became a little more involved. I would buy the latest keyboards, and, and I would take them on the road with me. And so, I'd plug in my headphones when the game was over and I would play. And, and a lot of times if I had a struggle in the game, it was like an escape. And it was interesting. I was kind of plateauing at that point as a pitcher. And I felt like God was telling me, listen, you know, I've got baseball for you right now, not music. And so I totally quit music. Even in the off season, I wasn't going around and singing uh, anywhere and that's really when my career took off, and I believe the Lord used that in a lot of ways uh, in my life and to affect others. Uh, but when I was done playing baseball, uh, I felt like he was telling me at that time, hey, you know, I have music for you now. And so it's funny, I got into that, and about two years after I retired, um, I just finished my first project, and it was already had already gone through and been um printed and is ready to go out to stores and all that kind of stuff. And I get a call. For, um, actually, I didn't get a call. I go up to Milwaukee to see the Cardinals. They were going to let me go on the air and talk about my new music mm-hmm. um, ministry and all that. And I'm in the hotel lobby and Tony LaRusso sees me. And he looks at me like he's just seen a ghost. And uh, he walks over to me and he goes, what are you doing here? And I told him and he goes, man, and he holds his hand up and goes, I swear, we were just talking about you in a meeting this morning uh, and they were struggling a little bit pitching wise. And I said, Tony, you know, I can't pitch anymore. Right. And he just laughed and uh, he said, Hey, come in and see me, come into the office uh, and see me tomorrow. So I did. And what they asked me to do is they asked me to, um, to scout for them to prepare for the playoffs and eventually the world series that year. And so hmm. I was doing that. 
uh, and because I was known because of the great teaching I had from Dave Duncan, I was known for being able to break down video really, really well. And uh, but it was always breaking down hitters. They were asking me to break down pitchers, hmm. and so I would do my reports and send them in. Um, and I got excited. I'd either be at the game or if I'm at home watching the game, I tell my wife, "Hey, listen, this is what's going to happen based on the scouting report." And all of a sudden, you know, a guy would hit a home run or a double, and I'd jump out of my seat, and I was loving it. Um, and they loved what I did for them, and they were very appreciative. But the same thing happened, man. It was uh, after that was all said and done. Uh, it was God saying, "Listen, I had baseball for you back then. Right now, I've got music for you." Because I just let my ministry part sit for like six weeks during this whole period of time. Didn't do anything, hmm. and so I was kind of I was neglected in the ministry that was being given to me. And so that's when I decided that's it. I can't I can't do any more baseball. I had to focus on the, the music ministry. And about that same time, not long after, I had a situation with my heart, uh, which really um, changed my life as well. So a lot of things happened in that short period of time. Tell us about that situation with the heart. You said it changed your life. How so? Uh, well, you know, I was young, whatever, I was 32, 33, and um, I was living in Indiana at the time, and it was winter time, and every time I'd go outside, I'd start feeling something in my neck, and it moved down in my chest, and um, so finally I went to go see a doctor and he did all kinds of tests and thought I had some kind of bronchial infection and told me to, you know, go ahead and take some of these pills and come back and see him a week later. Well, we happened to be down here in Florida on a visit during that week and I felt good. So I went out to jog and done that for a while. And within a minute, same thing, even though it was, you know, 78 degrees here, I felt it in my neck, I felt it in my chest and I, Got to an emergency room, and the uh, doctor came in and said, listen, all your tests look fine except for this one. It's just a tenth of a percent too high, but I have a feeling. And so they took me back uh, and went inside and found a uh, 99% blockage of my major artery, my LAD, hmm. left anterior descending, and they put a stent in it and explained to me that if I hadn't gone in, then probably within 24 hours I would have been dead. So wow. that's pretty sobering. Uh, and when I was in, uh, I was in my hospital room, I actually had a doctor that was doing his rounds. He wasn't my doctor, but he shared a story with me about the ministry that he determined he was going to have. And about six weeks later, his son was diagnosed with leukemia and ended up passing away. But he said, I wanted to blame God and I wanted to put my, push my ministry aside. But he said, I decided to go the other route and said, I was going to share Christ with every patient that came into my office. Hmm. And so he encouraged me to do the same thing. He said, this is an obstacle. This is probably there because, uh, you know, Satan wants you to be deterred. doesn't want people to hear about Christ through your music. And so it just made me stronger, uh, made me thankful for life, obviously, in general, also made me thankful for the chance that I had uh, to minister to people. And because of the heart situation, it wasn't just ministering to people my age. I mean, I had so many great conversations with people in churches and events that were in their 70s and 80s that they had stents. And so they could relate to me when I was telling my story. And so God just used it in a, a phenomenal way. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not saying I wanted to go through, go through it that way, but yeah. he really used it in a big way. How's your health today? No, I mean, all good. It's just one of those things where I have to obviously take care of myself and medication I need to take. I had a, I'll call it a relapse. We moved from Tennessee down here to, to West Palm to take this job, and I never got a new doctor, and I ran out of medication, and I felt good and wasn't having any problems. And I ended up having, uh, about a year later, a minor heart attack, and so they put in two more stents. Mm. And during that time, uh, the cardiologist told me, listen, man, your your heart is great. He said, unless you get hit by a bus, you're going to live into your 80s. He said, unless you stop taking this cholesterol medication. And so I got that message loud and clear and, and uh, I've been consistent with it, you know, ever since the last six years and everything's, everything's good. Feeling good. Very, you know, very active. Throw BP when my arm can take it. Um, but uh, yeah, doing well. Tell us the story because this full, the, the Gary Carter sort of relationship that you have or had with him kind of comes full circle in the way that you came into this job as the baseball coach at Palm Beach Atlantic University. Can you kind of take us through maybe the relationship with Gary through those years post-retirement and 
I, I think some people will know what led to you taking the job, but maybe kind of the circumstances and remembering um, how it co- kind of all came about. Yeah, you know, it's funny, not funny, but eight years later, it's still kind of difficult to tell the story. Um, yeah. But, you know, as I mentioned before, Gary and I had a previous relationship through baseball, um, had, had kept in touch a little bit, not regularly, but off and on. Um, a couple of years before I'd been down here in Florida, I was, I was working with a group out of uh, Tennessee and it was a project and part of it was trying to do some interviews with, um, well-known baseball players. And he sat down with me for two hours one day and let me just tape a conversation with him. Uh, that's the kind of guy that he was cause he wanted, you know, he wanted to help me out. Yeah. Um, you know, so a couple of years later, I'm actually doing a pitching lesson with my son up in Tennessee and I get a phone call from a friend in California. He's like, Hey man, I, just got a call from the athletic director at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And I'm like, oh, I know that school. My wife graduated from there. Hmm. He said, yeah, they're looking for an associate head coach. I'm like, well, okay. I mean, uh, he said, just call them and see see what the deal is. So I did and talked to the athletic director. And uh, the project up in Tennessee was kind of coming to a, an end anyway. And so I went through my first interview I've ever done in my life uh, over the phone, sitting in the parking lot in Nashville, Tennessee, speaking to you know, five people on the search committee here in Palm Beach Atlantic. And uh, they brought me down for, uh, I was one of three finalists, and they brought me down and sat with Gary the first night. And at that point, when they, he, he knew he was sick at that point, uh, yeah. developed the cancer, the brain tumor. Um, every, you know, we all thought he was going to survive that. And my hope was if I got the job, I could coach under him for a few years and, learn a lot about the game. He's an incredible mind for the game. Uh, Just amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was interesting. After two days, I got through all the interviews with the president and everybody else. And two days later, Gary calls me and said, hey, man, let's go have lunch. And I'm like, okay, he's going to tell me right there. And so I pick him up and we're driving. He's just talking about you know, the whole process and him and his wife, Sandy, taking a walk that night and they've been praying about all this. And he's not telling me, and I'm thinking, Gary, we just, you know, come on, man, just say something one way or the other. We get to lunch, we're sitting at the table and he's still not telling me, just talking about the process. So we go 20 minutes of this and I'm like, man, am I ever going to get an answer here? Hmm. And then he finally said, you know, I really feel like God is, is calling me to this position. So it was a sigh of relief. Um, and then the unknown began because I didn't play in college. As I said, you know, I was drafted right out of high school and I went. Yeah. Uh, man, I had a lot to learn. But, I, you know, at that time, in, at the stage he was at with the, the cancer, he'd come in a few times and kind of sit at the cage and talk to guys, but he wasn't really clear-minded at that point in time. And then got to the point where he couldn't come around at all. And then he came out our opening night in February, came down a golf cart to see the guys. Yeah. Um and then I went to see him in his house the next day just to talk to him about the game because he had to leave. Um, and then it wasn't long after that that he passed. And so here was this program, now mine, and never coached college in my life. Uh, and I had one assistant coach and, you know, 32 players. And mm-hmm. so it was trial by fire, uh, definitely trial by fire. But, you know what, he left a great legacy here for me, left a great foundation to build upon been able to do that and we've just been getting better uh each year and raising the program to different levels and something he certainly would have done himself yeah uh, but you know i feel honored that i could come in and, and take the place of somebody who's such a great baseball person but more than that just a great person uh all around yeah i i've had one sort of moment where i spent with gary and it was i was very early in my ESPN career, maybe 2001. And, um, we were trying to set up a, a legends interview is what they, what we called it at the time. And I remember calling him and I booked thousands of guests in my career uh, as a producer at ESPN. And I left a message. He called me back and we probably spent 35 minutes on the phone. This wasn't an interview. This was just a conversation that I was thinking was going to last three minutes. And, set up a time to tape and I would hang up and then we would do our interview whenever that was. And he stayed on the phone with me for 30 minutes and asked me hundreds of questions about my life, about my job, what I do. I don't remember if faith was a part of the conversation. I have to imagine it was, I I had not yet said yes to the Lord and became a Christian. I don't think, 
But I just remember uh-huh. thinking, growing. I grew up as a New York Mets fan. I still am. And thinking, I'm talking to Gary Carter, and this guy is asking me about my life. Who am I? I'm just some schmuck trying to book an interview. Uh, and again, you know him. You knew him very well. That says a lot about him to me. I presume he he was that way with pretty much everybody. Yes, he was. I mean, you know, here's a guy who Hall of Famer and just done some pretty incredible things, and he always tried to make everybody else be the most important person in the room. Absolutely. And, uh, that's just who he was consistently, yeah. and that was pretty awesome. What did uh, that time, not just watching Gary battle and fight and, and, and do the best that he could through his cancer battle, but also – for you taking over this team, like you mentioned, that's got to be scary. Um, what's going on faith wise for you during that? How are you, uh, you know, maybe looking back at it now, maybe some of the lessons and, and things that you learned staying connected to the source, right? Connected to God through such an interesting time when you're watching your friend go through what he's going through and yet still trying to carry on a legacy and be a coach of something you've never done before. Let me first say you asked some pretty amazing questions. I feel like you're in my head, which is which is a good thing, I think. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, that was that was the biggest part of it. You know, I, I basically came down here knowing nothing about coaching a college team. I came down here because I was trying to help out a friend and their family through a rough time and hopefully guide these young men who were essentially losing their coach um, to this cancer. Yeah. And so it was a balancing act, man. I didn't know these kids from Adam because obviously I had nothing to do with the recruiting of them. Uh, I tried to build relationships quickly, but it's it's tough. I mean, you know, they're going from a Hall of Fame player to a guy who was, you know, an average player and pitcher in the big leagues. And so there was a lot of questions. They wondered who I was, how I was going to do things. But I tried to help them focus on, on Gary and doing what they could to help him any way they could. And, uh, it was a rough season. I'm going to tell you right now, it was uh, one of the worst years of my life just because uh, I didn't understand, you know, 30, 32 guys coming from different backgrounds, whether it be baseball or personal home life. Um, how do you tie all these different things in together to all go one direction? Never had to do that. I'd coached, you know, Little League, and uh, you have to do that to an extent, but nothing close to this. Um, you know, and 18 to 22 years old is a, such a vital time in the life of a young man. And here I'm, I'm trying to guide them. Some of them who don't have fathers, so I'm trying to be a father figure. Uh, some of them who don't have good father, good fathers, even if they have one. And so you're fighting a lot of battles uh, in the sense that you're putting out a lot of fires and try to stay consistent in your approach, in your relationship with them, and make it unconditional while still trying to win baseball games on the field and help them to understand that your coaching is not a personal attack. It's constructive criticism. And so you, you start walking all those different tight ropes, uh, and it becomes difficult. And we had guys that responded well to it, and we had some guys that, that didn't. You know, I think they felt cheated out of the coach, and, and I get that. You know, and they had a lot of heartbreak over, over losing Gary on multiple levels. Um, so it was really rough. Um, the only reason I'm still here or came back that next year is I really felt like God – had moved my calling from helping out Gary to starting to have a ministry with a baseball team. And so, and it's been eight years. Uh, I've learned a ton. I still have a lot to learn. Um, still a lot of balancing acts because it's not just about the wins. And, and I've, I've found that competitive nature again and, and the way to compete by trying to win, but also I'm trying to present the bigger picture to these these young men um, in an unconditional love sort of way. And, you know, we've seen guys come to Christ. We've seen guys' lives change. We've seen guys whose lives didn't change. Um, Mm. But I'm really trying to be faithful in presenting the gospel to them, not just speaking it, but trying to live it uh, every day. Um, And, you know, I'm going to let God handle it how he wants to. I'm just trying to be faithful to his calling. He is Kent Bottenfield, the uh, former Major League Baseball pitcher and Palm Beach Atlantic University baseball coach. Kent, this is a treat to talk to you, to hear your story, and uh, thank you for spending the time with us here at Sports Spectrum. We'll catch up again down the road. Thanks a lot. Yeah, definitely. Anytime. Thank you. Great stuff there from Kent Bottenfield. Many thanks to Kent for being here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. I love the stories uh, that he shared, especially the stories of Gary Carter and the impact that Gary made on his life. Uh, Talk about a soldier for Christ, Gary Carter, that is, 
uh, the first day that Kent gets invited to have breakfast with Gary and he has his Bible out and let's go ready for some discipleship. And uh, that's such a cool thing. And I think about guys like Gary and uh, guys today trying to carry that mantle in Major League Baseball and people like Adam Wainwright come to mind and others who love Jesus and uh, still have such a big impact as veterans on these younger players. So uh, great stuff there from Kent Bottenfield, the former Major League Baseball pitcher here on Sports Spectrum's podcast. Thanks to you for listening. We, again, appreciate you uh, checking our stuff out, both the podcast, click the subscribe button so you never miss an episode, and our website, sportspectrum.com. That's the place to go. You can get all of our content there. You want to get archival content from 30-plus years of magazine articles, you can go there. You want a Sports Spectrum daily devotional, great way to start your day right with God, you can go there and find that as well. And if you want to hear any of our podcasts, over 300 plus, I mean, we're almost at 400 podcasts here at Sports Spectrum. Every single one is archived here at sportspectrum.com. So you can go listen to those interviews as well. Check out our social media pages as well, sports underscore spectrum. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Maybe send us a note, hit us a reply or a DM, or even just tweet this interview out, letting us know that you're hearing the content that we're putting out at Sports Spectrum. We'll retweet you and share and like and all that good stuff. Just love interacting with you through our social media pages. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time with a brand new episode. This is Sports Spectrum's podcast. I'm Jason Romano. Have a great rest of your day.